Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is Alabama journalist John Archibald. John Archibald won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for Commentary for his columns with the Alabama Media Group. He is recently the author of a memoir, Shaking the Gates of Hell, a search for family and truth in the wake of the civil rights movement. I spoke with John Archibald in Studio UA in the Digital Media Center on the campus of the University of Alabama. John, thank you for coming in. And thank you for having me. You're not only are you busy, but you're just you've just come back to town. I have from it, how you you won a Neiman Fellowship at Harvard. So you've got the Pulitzer from Columbia and the Neiman from Harvard, <laughs> and and a degree from the University of Alabama. Right. Well, you were up there. You actually got, in spite of the pandemic, you got to live in Cambridge. Yeah, for right. nine months. For nine months. It's wonderful, isn't it? It was great. It's a great way to spend a pandemic. Oh, I'll bet. Were cl classes in session? They were, although they were all in Zoom. They were all on Zoom. So all of our classes were on Zoom, and um, which was, you know, not the best case. But it, it's kind of nice in the dead of winter in Cambridge to roll out of bed and go to class <laughs> in your living room. So that's not so bad. And the restaurants. Well, I guess a lot of the a restaurants of were closed, closed too. Yeah. Closed. Oh, well. But, you know. It's still pandemic everywhere. It's still Cambridge. Yeah. You, the little I know about your biography, I don't think you've lived elsewhere much. Just briefly. You're not a odd. Birmingham person. Uh, at Birmingham, North Alabama. Right. Born in Alabaster? Born in right? Alabaster, but I only lived there for three months. Right. So. I, I used to go to Alabaster because there was a wonderful Italian restaurant there that I would go up and visit. Joe's Italian. They, they closed too. Uh, Years one through 15, 16, 17, before you came down here to Tuscaloosa, you were in, half a, you were in half a dozen towns. I mean, because your father was a Methodist preacher and he moved some. That's right. Alabaster, Huntsville, Jacksonville, <laughs> Decatur, Birmingham, and then they went on to Huntsville. And I went to Tuscaloosa. <laughs> right. you, you suggest little, little hints that the preacher's son the preacher's son sometimes is regarded as pious, but might be a son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and you had some of both, I guess, didn't you? Yeah, I think there are two types, though. I mean, uh -huh. and, and uh, uh, some of them really embrace the religion, go into the mm -hmm. father's, mother's footsteps, and some of them rebel, like. Uh, to prove that they're something else, and I uh, definitely fell into that later category. But I, I do, you know, I think that it seeped in, and I didn't get it, and some of that uh, that preaching may have uh, gotten into my bones in some other ways. Well, you you're famous as a virtuous person, well, <laughs> so well, that's a that's, so <laughs> yeah, that's a fraud. So there you are. <laughs> when you came down to the university, you you were in journalism, yes. Uh, I was, but I had five different majors before that. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so I walked into the Crimson White at one point trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life mm -hmm. and um, fell uh, madly in love with it. And uh, it uh, changed me and saved me, I think, in a lot of ways. You have said a lot of kind words about sports writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have you hold sports writing in high regard. I do. Well, I don't necessarily. So I'm <laughs> so I'm interested in in that. How, what is it about it that 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 catches your interest? Um, I love the way a really good sports writer can take sports and write about it in a in a way that tells stories and tells emotions and tells the people and tells a, of of those things in a way that makes us see a larger world beyond the field. Um, and, and it's not as simple as calling balls and strikes or, oh, no, or no. saying, you know, Nick called the bad play or, well, you know, that's, that of oh. course, would have consequences here. But uh, <laughs> No, but, uh, you know, people like Sally Jenkins at the Washington Post is just a master at, um, at I thought I turned that off, 
uh, a master at telling at, at telling those stories and what they mean in a wider world mm -hmm. and what they mean. Um, and that's and, and I, I got into this business because of sports writing. I, no. I thought I wanted to be a sports writer. And honestly, I came in the Crimson White, got assigned one sports story, went and covered a, uh, did a feature on an uh, Alabama athlete um, and said, I'd never want to do that again the rest of my life. And I started uh, being more interested in news and commentary and that sort of thing. Which sport? generates the best writing? I know the answer already, by the way. Well, I mean, you're going to say baseball. Yes, I am. <laughs> I don't know why you knew that. <laughs> because because it's, uh, it lends itself to that uh, with strategy and with history and which, with nostalgia and with, you know, it's a beautiful game and uh, with a lot of uh, subtlety. Um, and I think that, that that really lends itself yeah. because of a story on, you know, he struck out and he didn't. Is, it's not oh always no, that good. No. But I mean, I do think those things have lessons for wider journalism, um, just in the ability to tell stories that, right. that are, are real and mean something and get beneath the right. surface. I've read a lot of bad sports writing, yeah. and uh, mainly books about the, uh, what, the 2004 season, one play at a time, and it just make you just faint. But you didn't become a sports writer. You became an investigative reporter for mainly, uh, entirely the Birmingham News for years and years. And then after the great, <laughs> I don't know what you call it, the great change, let's the stay change. neutral. Um, Alabama Media Group, AL.com. Clearly, AL.com has made a go of it. I mean, you, you are all doing great work and people all over the state know that. But the state of newspapers in Alabama and in America, you want to yeah, th pitch th something th about daily newspapers? Yeah, I mean, local news is, yeah. you know, it's the life's blood of this country. Uh, and, and it is, it, it's, it, it's hurting everywhere. It's hurting here. Uh, I mean, we, we, we can't deny it. Um, uh, you know, I made a, a you know, a career Adam covering local news and um, whether that's the library board or the waterworks board or the city council or the county commission, all of those things are, ha have real importance on people's lives. And if we aren't looking at them, then we're not doing the job we need to do. Right. Also, it helps create this national divide because we don't have enough to, we don't have the news that, you know, that brings us together on a local level. So everybody tries to be a pundit for far away things that they know nothing about. And uh, it's dangerous. Well, at, at the local level, I mean, the joke is, uh, you know, if, if you're really nobody, you'll be sent to study to, to to cover the school board meeting. But in fact, somebody should cover the local chemi chemical plant because the local chemical plant is very likely poisoning everybody in Etowah County, whether they right. Whether and we've they, had that in North Birmingham. Whether and, they know uh, it or not. If you're not paying attention. We used to say at, at the Birmingham News. We used to say if you covered the that that went, the person who you know it, it was a bad assignment to go cover the county commission because nothing ever happened there. It was just so boring. Nobody wanted to hear it. Right. And so we didn't pay it enough attention, even when we had the resources at first. And then all of a sudden we found out that they're you know about to uh, declare the largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the world. <laughs> and um, so. Uh, so, I mean, that's when you don't look, that's what happens. Well, yeah. you're the gang that should not say, how did that happen? Right. Well, this <laughs> predated all of that. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, and I feel some guilt about, uh, you know, that because uh, we, we, we can't, um, we don't have the resources and we don't have the business model, really, that, that's going to cover all those issues, uh, the library boards and things, which I promise you interesting stories come out of. Oh, I, I know. And, um, I know. And so I feel guilty because, you know, a lot of people lost their jobs. A lot of people uh, aren't, cover aren't getting the news that they really like to get. Um, but at the same time, it's been very good to me. And so well, I feel some survivor's guilt in that regard. Well, real estate licenses, zoning, toxic waste, those things, they re really matter. And if nobody pays attention, then the people who profit will prevail. Right. A few years ago, I interviewed a, a man you may know, Neil White, who's a, Neil White is a Mississippian and he owned a bunch of 
magazines, and he got arrested and convicted and sent to jail. And his prison where he was sent was a leper colony. And he wrote a book about it. A and literal leper colony? It was. Um, a, it had, it was, there were half the, half the facilities in this campus were dried up lepers and the other half were prisoners. Wow. White collar prisoners. He was in a, basically, a, he kited checks. Mm -hmm. But he wrote a book about his experience called In the Sanctuary, <laughs> what was it, In the Sanctuary of uh, Misfits or Outcasts. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking to Neil, I said, you know, young writers envy you. <laughs> I mean, what better subject could there possibly be than spending two years <laughs> in a leper yeah. colony? That, uh, it's like a writer's it, camp. It's coming to you. <laughs> that is, you are an investigative reporter and, a, and write commentary in a place where we have Roy Moore and Governor Bentley and bizarre controversies over prisons and over um, um, gambling and lotteries. <laughs> and it's, it is, what a treat. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I quote Ron Casey a lot, the former editorial yeah. page editor of the yeah. News Pulitzer winner who died way too young, who said, you know, if you want great wine, you go to Paris, but if you want to write political commentary, you stay in Alabama. And, uh, yeah. and he's right in a lot of ways, although it does get frustrating in that you can write things all day long, and, um, and these days anyway, n not a lot changes. In the past, you could have some, a little more effect, but I, I don't think the resonance is quite there, and the, that divide I speak of is right. hard to overcome. Well, I read the dozen. Oh, I, I meant to ask, when you win the Pulitzer, do you win for a single commentary or ten? ten? I read them. I read those ten a couple of days ago, and <laughs> I have to say, Bentley was not among them. Bentley. Was, he had one. There was one. Was There's one a profile on Bentley yeah. at, at post mortem on the on his political career. But, but it's uh, it, it it's what material? How how rich we are. Just throw darts. <laughs> say where am I going to go today? But it's hard not to react to the most extreme things, the Mo Brooks, you know, rocks in the ocean kind of thing, um, because you know there's a there's a there's a feeling that you know that's sort of the, the goal of some of the outlandish rhetoric is to you know is to get people like me to come out against it, which makes it, uh, which it become become political political fodder for them, and they get more votes than they otherwise would. Right. Well, I'm like that seal of disapproval or what, whatever. It doesn't seem as if all publicity ought to be good publicity, but in elections, I guess maybe yeah. it is. Sometimes if you can spend it right for your constituents. Well, I, not a day passes that something, somebody doesn't, something doesn't come onto my screen about process servers chasing Mo Brooks <laughs> from place to place <laughs> to serve papers on him. Yeah, Th that, uh, and it looks like he's, May well be our next senator. So well, he'll team up very nicely with with, with our other senator. That's They'll make a pair. Mm -hmm. That's that's fine. Well, it is just it is a treasure house that that you that you uh, are examining. The gift that keeps on giving, like I said. And you have uh, they're reading some of your some of your material. I, I see what are almost like throwaway lines. It said says things like over a period of years I've interviewed X 15 times. And for you, that's, that's not rare. Right. I mean, you've talked to the same uh, long personalities time. over and over. You really know what, what's well, going I've on. I've talked to the same people over and over. They may not be the same personalities they were 15 <laughs> years ago, I will say that. Because uh, people are just more dug into the, to their their politics than they used to be. Oh yeah. Finally though, I mean after, you write three columns a, a week and you've done that for? Uh, since 2004. That is a lot of columns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, three or four thousand. Sure, sure. Well, you know, uh, Clyde Bolton right. he used to say people would come up to Clyde who was a sports writer oh, yeah. at the news. And, you, and you one would, of my, the examples oh, that right. I would have said. And he's a good, he's a good guy and a, was a good sports writer. But people would come up to him at parties and what have you, men. they say, I believe I could have written a column just like your column. He was covering Auburn basketball or what have you. And Clyde said, yes, I believe you could write one just as good as mine. 
but could you write 10,000? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And that's the difference between the professional and the amateur is you just keep right on doing it. And that, that treadmill is, is pretty tough. Well, when he stopped covering sports, he was relieved. He, yeah. was, he was tired. Yeah. Oh, he was a great one. He was. He is. He is. Well, he's not dead, but. Right. I, you were moved to write, uh, in a sense, an autobiography. It is, it is your story, but the center of your story is a study of your father, a Methodist preacher, son of a Methodist preacher. Grandson. And grandson, grandson of a Methodist preacher. It's just a miracle you're not a Methodist preacher. Yeah. Some, say, some people say I have a pulpit. But <laughs> well, you do. Well, you have a platform. It least. might be an offensive one. The, um, Uh, what I perceive, I don't think this is mysterious. I think the catalyst for your book is Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail in which King expresses his disappointment not only in Southern liberals, but in Southern liberal clergy for not doing enough, not saying enough, not coming out. Mm -hmm. And that is the complaint at the center of, I mean, you have, it is a warm picture of your father. Your father was a very, very good man. Mm -hmm. But 99.9%. Yes, .9 yes, now. but your, your complaint about your father right. is that he had a pulpit and it, by your lights, did not use it sufficiently. Can you expand on that? Yeah, and, and I've always felt a great fondness for that letter, probably in part because I was born in April of 63, right, at right, the, right. you know, essentially the same moment in time that was being done. And while I, you know, it took me until I was an adult to fully, to, to understand it, to, to even read it, right. um, it, uh, it really spoke to me in a lot of ways. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, I have always revered my father as the best man I've ever known, the best person I've ever known, frankly. Right. And and he tried really hard to um, to be inclusive and to teach me those things. And so, um, in that context, I, I, several years after he died, I found that he had left in my basement, among many other things, we moved in. Um, file cabinets containing every sermon he ever gave. Uh, and good. for some of those years, I'd, I had never come out and said, hey, what were you saying at this time, you know, in 63 or before or right, after? Right, right, right. And uh, yeah, I had kind of regretted that. And then I started to read them. And, um, and that's the first one I read, I, I believe, was was from uh, the, the moment in time when, uh, during the Children's Crusade yes. in Birmingham. right. And it happened to fall on Children's Sunday in the, on the Methodist Church calendar. Right. And uh, and he was in Alabaster at that time. And I and I read it. And it was a perfectly fine sermon. I mean, it was a perfectly fine sermon. It just said it just made no mention of anything that was going on around here or the, those children. And. Um, they talked about the problems of the world being in Asia and Katanga and <laughs> yeah. all these places. And, and, and it just struck me as, you know, that, that doesn't seem right. So I, that launched me on a search across, beginning with all the important days, dates of the right. civil rights movement and, and, and eventually to all of them. And, and I just found that, that what spoke the loudest was the silence uh, of it all. Yeah. Um, and there, there's lots of parable, there's lots of uh, hint. But until after the 16th Street ch Church bombing, and really until after, uh, a after new leadership of the Methodist Church came in and said it's okay to talk about these things. Um, there was nothing. So this terrific, horrific event is happening over here, but the sermon here says, "Look way over there, <laughs> right, right. And, and not right here outside your stained glass windows." Right. And I, you know, and I, and I, so I started talking to his contemporaries and talking to people, was, you know, to try to figure out people who'd studied it, what what was happening, and and uh, you know, there's a there's a uh, professor named uh, William Nicholas who who'd written a book about the conspiracy of silence, as right. it were, within the Methodist Church, and and that was really. Uh, you know, that that's really what it was. It was that people were encouraged, discouraged from talking about those things from the pulpit, uh, keep politics out of the pulpit, which as Bill said, you know, is a political decision. 
yet it was it was the it was the rule rather than the exception. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that was it was a very very rare individual who stuck his neck out. And, and many of them paid a price. Yes. I lately one of the things that, that seems to be coming up in on my evening news in the paper and here and everywhere is something loosely, I, I don't know if this is a wonderful term or not, but I'm going to call it presentism. It is, we, are, we, are, we seem to want to apply the ethics, the rules, the laws, the behaviors of this moment to previous moments so that the men in Mad Men behave badly. They behave as men behaved in 1955, but we think of them as behaving badly. And, uh, and I, I have a theory that I'm generating alongside this, which is I, d I don't think that we empath I don't think that we understand, feel the amount of fear. I, I, I'll, I'll be more specific. You read about slavery and you think, well, why didn't those slaves just rise up and kill those plantation owners. There were a hundred of them and four of them, right? Or, or why, didn't the, why did the Jews allow themselves to be put into boxcars? I don't think that we're empathizing enough with the element of fear at that moment. We think we would be really remarkably wonderful if no. we were... <laughs> I'm not saying that. No, no, I'm not. I, I, it's facetious, of course. Yeah. But, but you do. You, you, we, I think we, we, we want, we wish more more bravery, more courage, more stand up on, on historical moments than, than maybe we should. Just as we wish present day virtues, we say oh, he was a man of his time. Well, that may not be good, but, right. right. I mean, I think that's an absolutely fair point. And I, it's what I wrestled with uh -huh. the entire, it's what kept me up at night when I was uh -huh. writing this uh -huh. book. Um, and um, there, you're absolutely right. We, there's no way in the world we can go back and put ourselves in a place and time that's not our own. Right. We have no idea how we, we would react and we, would ha we have no idea how we would behave. Um, and, um, uh, but we can look at the people we admire the most is my, what I tell myself. Clifford and Virginia Durr. Right. Stand up for, in right. your book, that's, that right. would be. Right, or, or, or my dad. My dad, if I look at my dad, the person I admire the most yes. in the world, and I can see where he failed to use the pulpit he had to, to speak for the things he cared about. Yeah. Uh, that tells me about the pressure you're talking about. It tells me about the fear, whether he's fear for, fearful for us or for his, his being able to provide for yes, us. Yes, of course. Or, or those things, I fully get that. But we can look at those people and assess where we are today in our own ability to speak to the issues of our day. Right now. Right now. Right. Yeah. And so uh, that's the point I was trying to make. I, you know, it, it is in a lot of ways a book about my dad, but in my mind it's a book yeah. that's told through my dad that's about, it should be about us or, yeah. or about, you know, oh. me or about well, uh, the, any of us who want to speak and don't know how. We're not. Reading your book won't fix the past, but reading no. your book may help us to cope with this moment better. Right, right. and more, tomorrow, perhaps. More courageously. Perhaps. And, and I mean, more I, I, don't, I don't mean to sound so vain that that would be the case, but that was the intention. Right, right. It, it, and it works. And, and, you know, one of the things anybody who reads your book is, is going to be just as fond of your dad as you were. In fact, I, I may have gone overboard in my sympathy for <laughs> No, I mean, it's perfectly fair. <laughs> it's perfectly fair. I mean, it's a story. It's a, I mean, it's a love story in, uh, about a guy who, uh, when you, after I found out that he was not perfect. Well. As none of us are. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but, it, but it's not, you know, it, to me, it's really just a, a you know, it, it boils it, pretty simple principles. I mean, who do you want to be? And uh, if the you know if you can if you can see where where others maybe didn't do enough, um, you can do more. Right. And towards the end of your father's life, on the issues that arose that were with um, gay issues and feminist issues and other issues that came along towards the end of his career, mm -hmm. he rose up more right. better. He did. He yes. did. And, and to be clear, you know, 
in the whether it was the racial issues or the, uh, the or the gender issues or the LGBTQ issues, whatever they were, he always demonstrated first love for people. Yeah, and whether he could find out a way to to uh, say that specifically from his pulpit was one thing. Whether he demonstrated in his life was another, and so he he was he was always, you know, his actions spoke a lot louder than his words did. Right. Uh, or he, or as uh, I think Solomon Crenshaw, who wrote a piece for the Birmingham Times we had talked about earlier, um, said that he preached what he, he, he uh, what was it, he uh, couldn't preach what he practiced. Oh, right. Well, in spite of having written a million words, thousands and thousands of columns, that was your first book. But once, once a fellow gets a taste of book publication, it's, it's hard to stop them. So there will be a second and a third. What kind of projects are you working on now? Yeah, I'm, work, I'm putting together a proposal on uh, one. I'm trying to, to, to work on this a little bit lighter. Um, I haven't got all the details worked out on that. But uh, oddly enough, when, when I was uh, up north, I, I took a few classes in playwriting and it got the bug bit me. And I, and I had one uh, produced up there with the Harvard uh, is it still the 47 it's workshop? A, no, it, it was no. just the Harvard Playwrights Fest. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And um, we just did a reading and it went over pretty well. So I'm really trying to get a, All right. a play. I mean, it's of course about Alabama and politics so, and yeah, yeah. life and death and that sort of thing. But, um, but I, you know, I want to do that. But I, 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 I really feel like, you know, the, whether it's book or plays or, you know, podcasts, which I've done a few lately. I mean, finding different ways to get that message out, I think, is, is really critical, particularly in this age when uh, people have a knee-jerk reaction to um, political commentary or to me personally or to anybody that they automatically assume is going to hold a particular position. And so I think that, you know, I'm, I'm trying to explore different ways to tell stories that Right. May or may not reach people. Well, if this play gets made, I'll come and see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very dark. Very, very dark. That's okay. <laughs> it's likely to be. Yeah. Alabama Noir and all that. <laughs> That's right. I love that. That's what we'll call it. <laughs> this has been a pleasure. Thank you, John. I appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate you.